Hello, and welcome to the Health Go Live webinar series. Today's episode is brought to you by your friends at Advisory Board. We would like to remind you that the Q&A feature is available, so feel free to send in your questions throughout the discussion. And with that, I will turn it over to Natalie Trebes, who joins us from Advisory Board. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me here. Um, it's wonderful to be here with you all. A um, lot of people here. We've got some questions in advance, so I will do my best to work those in. I'm coming to you from the advisory board, which is a healthcare business research firm. Um, we work with all different sectors of the industry, but we have a history, especially in hospitals and health system strategy. So today's discussion is centered on what's called our state of the industry research, which is our perspective on the forces shaping your business environment right now, the biggest decisions that healthcare leaders are facing about their strategy for the next several years. And it's really a reflection on where the industry stands right now as we deal with a mountain of fires that make us feel really stretched between solving the crises of the present and planning for the future. So as, um, as I said, I'm Natalie Treves. I lead the executive strategy research team here at the advisory board. And so I sit at the intersection of all of our different dedicated teams that focus on specific topics and sectors. So I'm gonna work in questions from the chat as they come in as, as possible, but I've also gotten some in advance and I will do my best. I know there's a lot of you here. Please feel free to let us know if there's anything we don't get to and you'd like to chat with us um, after the presentation as well. So let's dive in. Uh, despite the really lively pep and pump up music at the beginning, I think we can all agree right now that the short term in healthcare really, um, it feels terrible in, honest, in all honesty. Um, as we talk with different executives, it's a volatile, chaotic moment in healthcare. It feels a little bit emotionally like this runaway train that's headed over a cliff. It's also collapsing into a volcanic eruption or something like that. Um, these are all urgent pressures that leaders have to deal with right now. It's really easy to get overwhelmed by the challenges of today um, that many of you face. We call them you know, fires that you have to put out. It also can be easy to be overzealous about some of the opportunities that a few of you lucky ones um, have, have the ability to go after, those shiny things, investment, talent, capital, partnerships. Um, it feels like for every fire you have to put out, someone else might have that shiny opportunity to go after. So I really encourage everyone to take a second and you know, look at what's on this slide here. Absorb some of these concepts. Do you see yourself anywhere on this slide? Do you feel more like you are having to deal with the things on the left-hand side, these challenges and opportunities, more so than you can focus on the things on the right-hand side, the long-term strategic trajectory? I think if we're not thinking about the future that we're aiming for, we're going to act myopically. For example, making overambitious promises right now um, to try to attract any talent we can, only to later realize we need to recalibrate where that money goes and think about care delivery shifts going on. When we zoom out, the industry really stands um, in this position that's familiar to any business leader, right? You are dealing with urgent priorities now that can distract you from your future goals. But today it's happening to an extreme. It feels aggressively urgent again, is exactly the time to be thinking about the future that we're trying to chart towards. So what I want to do today with the time we have is unpack some of those big, urgent, present realities so we understand the context. The workforce crisis is straining our core delivery operations. We're looking at coverage shifts, recent and upcoming. We're seeing a lot of vertical ecosystem building, innovation investment flows. We've laid them out here on the slide for you, and I'm going to go through each of these in more detail. But I want to be clear that these are all opportunities to be thinking about how you are going to address the crisis in the moment, the opportunity in the moment, while building to where the industry is headed or where you specifically want to shape the industry to go. So let's dive in. Let's start with the global stressors, this economic environment we're dealing with. Um, of course, inflation has gone a little bit better recently, but still hitting healthcare with a big lag and pushing into um, the labor shortage that we're facing, a workforce crisis across our sector. Last year, pretty much anything anyone could talk about, especially at the very beginning and, and really in 2021, was how volumes were looking, whether it was concern about revenue flows or unexpected utilization or crowd out and just capacity in general. Those have returned in terms of demand to pre-pandemic levels um, and there's room to expect that that's only going to continue to increase, but it's really about the costs that we are all stressed about. 
the dramatic cost increases are the big place of focus across the last year that's caused all of this consternation in healthcare. Labor costs, of course, the most severe, um, you know, depends on where you start counting from, but we've seen a 37% increase across two years. That's pretty big. Um, we didn't picture on here the large increases in supply and drug expenses, but also exacerbated um, the input costs. All of that is a complicated, intertwined problem for the whole industry. I think very obviously providers, especially hospitals, um, really struggling to keep margins positive. 2022 had nearly unprecedented operating losses. In response, what we've heard is service rationalization, workforce strikes, layoffs, leadership changes, even closures of, of some hospitals. So it's a really difficult environment. That creates pressure that starts to show up in premiums, right? Um, you know, we've seen a lot of difficulty with the rate increases that came from CMS. A lot of that turned into providers seeking higher reimbursement rates, rates from commercial payers. That shows up in premiums that they have to go to individuals and employers with. And all of this is happening at this time where there's growing scrutiny in the capital markets. Um, you know, there were substantial valuation drops over new ventures in healthcare over the last year. Um, it's going to give investors pause for the future, especially as interest rates are so much higher right now. Now, it's still not clear exactly where the economy is heading. Um, even though the market's in a downturn, unemployment is still at an extreme low. And there's still talk of a soft landing. I think in general, anybody who's predicting anything specifically for the next six to 18 months is probably um, not an expert. But we've really got to brace ourselves for the nuances of healthcare contracting because inflation hits at a lag. It gets baked in really slowly as contracts come up for negotiation, even though some folks are asking to renegotiate right now. It's painful for providers right now with the, with the rate increases not keeping up, but it's going to later bring us to prices that might be out of step with the rest of the economy, right? Consumers are going to still start to feel that heat in 2023 across the year and 2024 and beyond, um, and purchasers will be pressuring there. So, you know, we got a question uh, about how do you build awareness among stakeholders about the acute challenges for healthcare providers um, facing right now in terms of threats to the services they provide. And I think that's a really good thing to keep in mind amidst all the contention we're seeing in network rate negotiations. It's actually really about getting back to the details here. It's not the margin overall that's the issue. It's that an entire workforce has recognized that they've been overworked, undercompensated, that quality and safety are at risk, that the staff represent a huge portion of the community itself. So you really have to get into the actual um, considerations that purchasers, that others in the community might be more um, interested and willing to meet you on. So let's look at that, that staffing piece more closely, actually. When we look at the workforce these days, you know, I'm sure many of you are experiencing this. We're seeing prolonged, deep shortages, especially in the frontline clinicians and support staff roles. And I think health systems really face this vicious cycle where staff are leaving due to the work environment that's so difficult and straining then the facilities are understaffed and they have to focus on these short-term fi fixes like travel nursing or contract labor. And that itself leaves an enormous strain on the workers that are still there. It feels like leadership is maybe willing to pay any costs to meet capacity needs rather than addressing some of these long-standing challenges. This is not new. It's just at a more difficult and unsustainable level than ever before. So that those staff in turn leave and that kind of restarts the cycle and we get stuck here. I think it's important to pay attention to the big reasons that registered nurses in particular want to leave their jobs. It's insufficient staffing and it's workload intensity. Um, when our workforce research team looked into that, they found that a huge part of this is not just the RN staffing shortage itself. It's about all of the other roles around them because RNs, they are able to do so many different things um, and their essential capabilities. They've become this huge priority, the biggest priority of staff. And they're essentially a catch-all in this time of crisis. So they have to take on tasks that other assistants and techs might do. So a big place that we actually need to focus is on all of the non-RN tasks um, to free them up to perform at their top of license and build this pipeline of talent to support that. But I wanna recognize, again, the staffing problems and the potential solutions are not happening in a vacuum we're going to have to have context on the entire work environment and the local community. And we're gonna to have to start asking these questions on the side here about 
how much can we experiment with what normal staffing models are? What is going to change over this period of time where everything um, is a moment of disruption, where we can really think differently about what we've accepted as fundamental truths about the working environment and start to question what does it mean um, that, what, what do workers want out of their, their environment in the workplace? Because I think we really have to recognize the humans themselves, the staff are trying to better their circumstances, whether it's you know, employer that they feel more comfortable with, um, better staffing ratios, better pay. When we look at the, the field of, of the workforce in healthcare, you know, the challenge is often called across the whole economy, the great resignation. That is definitely the wrong way to characterize what's happening in healthcare, I think. Um, you know, some individuals are leaving healthcare altogether, and certainly in other sectors, we are starting to see layoffs, though unemployment, again, is still very low. The healthcare sector is adding jobs still. Um, across uh, the 2022, I believe, is about 500,000 jobs or more that were added over the year. And a lot of times when you look at your own organization, you probably wouldn't think that many jobs got added to, to the healthcare sector. It's really a question of where individuals are shifting within our industry that's looking different. And so that's where we're seeing this great realignment. Depending on who you are, that's not necessarily bad. Um, there are real opportunities to attract talent. That's what you see on the right-hand side of the slide. We're seeing ambulatory providers, virtual providers, third parties like tech and retailers having fewer problems finding talent, and that sort of extends to some health plans and purchasers as well. But what this amounts to is an acceleration of the growth of competing sites of care. So alternative sites of care, non-traditional players that have more flexibility to accommodate those pay our benefit needs um, that can position themselves as maybe even more competitive as a result of this. And so when we think about the context of the you know, general economy, I've actually heard some leaders tempted into thinking, you know, a little recession might be nice, just a light recession um, when it comes to our clinical labor shortages. I think that's really, really difficult way of thinking. Um, you know, if you look at past recessions, healthcare employment certainly has gone up while other sectors lost jobs. But again, we have to keep in mind right now how high overall employment is. And more importantly, this big shift we've seen in the workforce about their expectations for the healthcare working environment and their alternative healthcare employment options available to them these days. The bar is just changing. And while I don't expect that every single company or startup is going to exist um, in five years, and if we see a little bit more of a um, you know, contraction in the economy, we will see a lot of pressures on some of these ventures, they're not all going to go away, right? We are starting to explore new territory here and staff are moving along with that. So a lot to pay attention there. I now wanna shift over to the different types of demand that's hitting um, the healthcare industry for both the services and, and the products that we provide. On the more direct care side, um, healthcare organizations you know, are facing a seemingly unending set of different outsized healthcare needs that compound over time. Um, you know, our public health system and the industry as a whole remains strained by the new and ongoing public health concerns. So both the left hand and right hand side of the slide here, you've got the triple demic of, of COVID, RSV and the flu, crowding emergency rooms still, straining capacity and resource allocation, continuing to put pressure on that workforce. And that doesn't even account for um, you know, the pressure we face from the ongoing challenges and threats of the opioid epidemic, natural disasters and the like. And then of course, long present, but really thrown into overdrive by COVID and the socio-political economic turmoil for the last few years, massive growth in behavioral health needs, partly from conditions arising more, um, partly from a severity increase overall. And then also I think just a general awareness and appetite from the population and recognition that um, of what their behavioral health needs are and what the importance of mental health and the willingness to go seek and access care for that. Then finally, you got new chaos in the form of the overturn of Roe v. Wade, which is still working its way through um, the different policies that states have been pursuing as a result of the, the um, ending of that, that precedent. 
So that's changing the types of reproductive care needs that are coming to different um, parts of the nation as um, patients kind of migrate, employers start to pursue a lot of travel benefits um, to enable their staff to go to different states depending on the care they need. And that brings a lot of legal complexity for staff and having to think about one more or 50 more layers here. So putting this all together, that means um, an environment where demand for healthcare is varied, it's extreme, and it's hitting healthcare workers when they have little bandwidth. But there's more to demand than just the healthcare needs um, and the, the profile of the population. It's also about the source of financing and the different incentive structures that those um, payers and purchasers bring. So on the left side here, you'll see changes in insurance enrollment from just before the pandemic hit to mid-2022 really big shifts in the coverage mix. And it's not something to um, you know, miss in the, in the midst of all of this. We saw a decrease in the employer um, enrollment that has come back a little bit. Um, so it's a little bit mitigated from where it initially started. Um, part of this through job losses, but part of this through alternative coverage options becoming more available and more attractive through the safety nets. Obviously, massive, massive jump in managed Medicaid. That's where we saw the highest enrollment gains. I think everyone is probably pretty familiar with that. The public health emergency or PHE expanded access to Medicaid and crucially suspended state's ability to disenroll people, which meant far more enroll enrollment into Medicaid than was lost from employer coverage. So there's a little overlapping there. Now that policy is going to end in April um, as a result of the um, omnibus package that Congress passed recently. And that's gonna mean that um, you know, enrollees might start to come off of Medicaid. They might be kicked off of Medicaid effectively. Um, there's an estimated 18 million that could lose Medicaid coverage. It's definitely not gonna be overnight. Different states have different policies for unwinding this. Um, and it's also a big question of whether those who lose Medicaid go to other coverage sources or become uninsured. So that has a big implication for the payer mix that's showing up to providers and what their different sources um, of, of reimbursement are coming from and how those rates are set. If we see a decrease in Medicaid and a big increase in individual coverage and employer um, coverage, then that might be actually an improvement for providers. If we see more of a shift to uninsured, that might be really difficult. I also don't wanna miss the shift in Medicare to Medicare Advantage. And I'm sure that is a very common refrain for a lot of you, the big continued march forward of, of Medicare Advantage, um, the private form of Medicare, continued growing quickly over the course um, of the, the last few years. And we saw some beneficiaries actually drop their traditional Medicare coverage to switch. Obviously, we've all been watching this over the last decade, um, and we are actually approaching nearly 50% enrollment penetration. Um, we might actually be hitting that as we speak uh, with annual en enrollment going on right now. It was actually just helping my parents enroll in Medicare uh, last night. So that overall rapid growth, um, I think, is important to also watch in terms of what's going on with insurers, because the shifting of business lines um, has an impact depending on what kind of insurer you are. Some of the larger national insurers and a few of the, the larger blues plans have this broader book of business where they can operate in different business lines in different places. And so the shifting enrollment um, actually has brought a lot of really favorable business to the health plans, especially the large nationals, in the form of this government coverage. Um, the losses that they had were transferred to other segments of their business. Not all of that is true for the smaller, more regional plans. Um, some of them focus in particular business lines. And so this kind of shift has a big implication for um, the continuity of enrollment they have overall and their overall financial health. In just the last year though, I, I wanna double click on the Medicare Advantage growth in particular because the largest insurance players um, made some of their biggest MA gains yet. So United picked up almost a million new MA members over the course of um, the 2021 or uh, 2022. And just in the last year, um, you know, they far outpaced Humana and Aetna, the next biggest MA players. So this big focus on, on MA is something of a virtuous strategic investment cycle for these large plans. They're attractive finances um, because you have both full risk ownership 
and there are risk and quality adjustments and bonuses available. And so if you have growth here, it brings in outsized revenues. Those margins can be used to finance other relevant capabilities like care management and provider services that help improve quality and risk coding documentation that then further turns into gaining MA enrollment. So it's a very, um, you know, a virtuous cycle where these plans that are excelling are going to continue to be able to grow because they're able to build out that infrastructure. And I think in particular, um, the, the Medicare Advantage financing model is also really conducive to value-based care contracting models uh, and, and has implications for how we keep progressing there. So let's talk about where payments stand um, in value-based care. Overall, while participation in value in risk-based payment is increasing, there are still limitations for who's participating in population-based risk specifically. So on this on the slide here, for each segment, um, the red boxes highlight the biggest place where the payment has decreased over this time period um, from 2018 to 2021, 2017 to 2021. Um, and the green boxes show the biggest place where the payments increased. And as you can see, only Medicare Advantage has really made this big jump in population-based payments um, since 2018 with about a 15 percentage point increase. And only Medicare Advantage has overall more than 50% of their payments in shared savings or population-based um, payment models, which are the areas where we would think more risk is on the table, more um, payments are vulnerable to bending on performance. I, I think the 60% statistic in the title here is really interesting because you can slice it a few different ways. So 60% of payments overall are in some kind of quote unquote value model. But similarly, at least 60% of payments overall have no real risk involved in them. Um, and that's not even getting into you know, what percentage of those revenues actually are in flux, depending on um, your performance. So if we think about $100, if all of that is, or 100%, if all of that's at risk, but only 1% is going to be the penalty that you pay, depending on your performance, um, you know, you might question how much of that is truly at risk dollars. So Medicare Advantage making a lot of progress here um, and really outpacing everyone else. When it comes to commercial payers, though, there's not really a fully formed model. Um, we've seen mostly experimentation and fragmentation. I think that's kind of natural given the, the way the landscape works. And employers, without question, they want the improvements that value-based care um, proponents really purport to offer. You've, in theory, got higher quality, better experience, and lower costs as possibilities on the table. But they have a lot of factors they have to weigh in terms of whether value-based care makes sense for them. How much work do they need to do? What will the employees absolutely not tolerate? Are their employees going to be comfortable with more hands-on approaches from different um, you know, members of the care team and the, the insurance product? What kinds of cost savings can they actually get? Because I think if you compare to the Medicare Advantage and CMS models, you know, CMS has done a lot of experimentation, um, a lot of failures, a few successes, and they've arrived at a kind of a general overarching roadmap to follow, inching towards this population-based risk. So there's a distinction in the management strategies between the Medicare models and the commercial population. It is fundamentally a different population health approach, a day-to-day -day clinical model from what we see in the, the senior population, what you would need to do in the, the commercial population. You tend to have a healthier population there, um, so a lot of what you'll need to do in commercial risk is to keep people from developing the condition in the first place, but also if they are going to get a procedure, not overuse care that they don't need. In the senior care population, it's a lot more about increasing primary care utilization and coordinating complex chronic condition management. When commercial patients have an issue, the savings really come from getting their attention as soon as possible steering them to the most cost-effective treatment options, providers, sites of care, what have you, rather than this focus on coordinating across a bunch of different um, parts of the, the care ecosystem. So when we look at this, um, you know, where this is headed in the future, the industry really has to think about taking a fundamentally different direction when it comes to commercial payments 
versus Medicare, which I think begs the question of whether there's a viable path forward for commercial risk. Now, I want to be clear. I don't think there's a world where there's zero commercial risk, but they could follow two general paths forward. One is possible where we do follow more of the Medicare model um, because having everyone follow something that's similar to to Medicare is going to be easier for providers on a day-to-day basis, right? We hear all the time about the complex array of quality metrics and processes across all different payers. It's just not workable for providers. And so some standardization is actually possibly a way to make more progress here. The other side of the coin is one where, um, you know, everyone competes with each, with each other to find these high spend targets and partnerships to address just those, you know, think the center of excellence models in particular, and maybe more narrowly scoped options around bundles. This is a choice that leaders have to think about. Um, where do they want to place their bets? Where do they want to influence where their contracts are going as we look at the unfolding value-based care landscape? What are they put, putting in front of employers? What are they pitching employers on? How are they making it easy for employers to work with them? And I actually just got a question um, about how the Consolidated Appropriations Act is influencing healthcare decisions. Um, and I actually think that's really interesting in the context of value-based care because in, in the long and the short of it, for anyone who's not familiar, there is a new provision um, about employer fiduciary obligations for their healthcare benefits. Um, it basically means that employers are now liable to ensure that their benefits payments are quote unquote reasonable, which of course is fuzzy. There's gonna be a lot of lawsuits and case law to settle what that means. But I think there's definitely potential for brokers, plans, PBMs, providers to really think differently about how are they pitching and demonstrating and articulating and proving value, again in quotes, for their services to employers because employers are going to have a newfound level of interest here. Um, That could ultimately influence the payment model experimentation, um, the ways that that, plans and providers and others are putting options in front of employers, but also how they are documenting that. The last thing, that I want to flag here in terms of payment incentives is what's happening with health equity. Now this health equity in general, as I'm sure many of you have paid attention to, is an area um, that everyone across the industry was really quick to proclaim was central to their mission in the midst of 2020. As COVID disparities became clear in the wake of awareness after George Floyd's murder, There was so much activity, press releases, commitments to investments and the like um, uh, from the entire industry around the actions they wanted to take to address healthcare disparities, to pursue health equity as a goal. It was a big mission statement. The big question that that around that time and, and moving forward is whether we transform from mission alone into something that is a business mandate. And I actually think we are starting to see the breadcrumbs of that that evolution. So CMS, of course, has a big focus on pushing towards equity incentives, funding opportunities, general messaging. Um, But a few plans and employers are starting to coalesce around this tactic of holding provider organizations accountable for delivering equitable care by weaving equity into the quality metrics. So we are on the verge of saying that equity is a piece of quality. The same way you would get a payment bump if you achieve certain quality metrics and maybe penalties if you're unsuccessful. Um, We're starting to hear, you know, maybe it's no longer good enough to have the average be how that quality bonus is determined, how that quality outcome is determined. If you have disparate outcomes between groups, between socioeconomic groups, between racial groups, um, you are going to be accountable for that as well. It's not good enough is, is where we think some purchasers are headed. So some interesting approaches here on the slide. Um, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Massachusetts has been leading the charge and developing a lot of this. Morgan Health, which is um, the new health initiative from JP Morgan, is applying this to care for their employees and is building out a, a contract with Kaiser. CMS's ACO REACH model, of course, is replacing the whole direct contracting model and involves the health equity benchmark. And NCQA has built this into the national standards. So all of these start with incentives to collect data first. Um, There's a lot of recognition that we have a long road ahead of us, but the ambition is to build this as a foundation to get to more of a point of rewarding quality and including equity and quality. 
Now, I think there's an open question of, you know, how far do we get to, um, you know, is this only going to be about certain metrics? Is this very much going to be anchored in the same things we see with HEDIS and STARS? Um, or will we get even further beyond that? Because when we think about health equity, we all know, um, anyone who's been looking at this, that there are so many different layers to this, so many root causes, so many systemic inequalities and lacks of, lack of um, structural support across society. That is a very hard um, piece to only pin into the narrow uh, world of quality metrics. And so we have to be careful of using that as a foundation without confining our actions there. So a lot of different um, pieces uh, to all of this, but in general, a huge amount of change, both from the types of issues coming to providers and coming to the healthcare system, to the sources of payment that are you know, taking care of those patients, to the incentive structures that are actually in place. Now, we're about to turn to um, the vertical ecosystems, uh, because I think that is really an interesting answer to the question of how will we navigate within those different payment structures we've got. Um, but I want to first address one question I got in the chat is part of the challenge for commercial ch payers to shift to population risk like Man Medicare Advantage is that commercial plans might not have enrollees um, long enough to benefit from long-term investments in population health management. And I think that absolutely is one of the hearts of the issue here in the employer space, which exactly is why there might be this divergence um, in the approaches we take. And that's why I think we see so much more of a focus on bundled payments um, in particular and on the centers of excellence type of approach because it's very oriented on a single decision, a single episode, rather than investments in you know, preventive care that might take years to ultimately accrue to, um, you know, diverting the trajectory of that patient. So it's a great point. All right, let us turn now to the um, vertical ecosystems that we're, we're seeing. I think that starts by talking about what's not working first in terms of how do we navigate healthcare, um, and that's pure play consumerism. And hopefully a few of you bristled at that and you're in working in businesses that are really oriented around consumerism. Um, and I, I hope that that gave you the you know, heart palpitations that you needed to keep paying attention here. Um, I think it's worth you know, unpacking where are consumers at today and how are they actually navigating healthcare? Right now, consumers are dealing with the aftermath of the continuing pandemic, of course, and the current economic flux. They need help with care. They know they want better, cheaper options, but they also know that they're not well positioned to make those decisions themselves. Let's talk about what it would take for consumers to actually navigate all of those different care options um, in a truly you know, classic free market consumeristic way. To be able to shop for healthcare, you have to have a lot of factors in place. We've laid them out on the slide here. I think this is one of my favorite slides to reference. Um, so definitely take a screenshot. We will also send you a link to the deck um, towards the end here so you can reference this as well. Um, but it's good to come back as you're thinking about any kind of navigation in healthcare and any kind of journey that involves the patient choices of these principles. And I think when we look at healthcare, the only factor that healthcare consumers really have going for them is options to choose from, right? They certainly have options um, in certain parts of the country, certainly in regional areas, maybe too few. Um, but in a lot of places, there are far too many. There's an ever-growing number of ambulatory sites to choose from. We've got tech and retailers all trying to get in the game, um, a lot of different tools even to navigate um, some of those, and that starts to support there. But for the most part, all of the rest of these conditions are not met. And I think one of the most important ones to understand is this awareness of choice. So much of healthcare consumerism is predicated on the patient knowing that they're making a choice in the moment. Um, so much of the norms we have for how workflows uh, work and, and delivery norms um, teach us to just do what the clinician tells us to do. It's rightfully so, they are the experts. Think of any time you've gone in for a visit and there was an additional you know, shot or scan or referral um, and you maybe just went along with that, that next step, not even thinking that you were making a decision by saying, oh yes, I can have that while I'm here. That was you making a healthcare consumerism decision. 
Um, and so when we start to understand that it's very rare for you to be making a decision in healthcare the way that you would shop for anything else, um, it's not just about the differences in how you shop, but it's the when you shop that I think is really hard for us to overcome. That's why I think we're starting to see a lot of work on trying to avoid first forcing consumers to do all of this work and focusing more on building the infrastructure for navigation, setting up the choices for them on behalf of consumers. That's why I think we see a lot of this realignment um, of you know, what assets different companies are trying to assemble so they can better manage the overall healthcare journey of a consumer. Um, got a question about how the new transparency rules would um, impact healthcare here. Uh, and I probably because we put that on the slide. Um, so I think the biggest impact is in creating um, a database for purchasers to mine and analyze uh, if they so choose and put scrutiny on payers and providers. I don't think the impact here is really the direct consumer angle. There might be a little bit um, in the form of putting tools in consumers' hands that are easier to use. But I do not think the direct um, just availability of price data for consumers alone is enough. I think it is more about the input on the rest of the forces that are creating their, their environment. So let's talk about the, the vertical integration that we're seeing. The national insurance companies, um, I think, are very much leading the charge here. They are becoming more and more these self-proclaimed health solutions companies, these behemoths um, with activities in nearly every part of the industry. Um, what you see on here are the 2021 revenues for the various big business segments across these national players. Blue represents their insurance arms. The dark blue is their commercial insurance revenues, mostly employer sponsored. Light blue is the government insurance. Black is their PBM revenues, and then red and, and gray in some cases are the, the provider revenues from care delivery and other um, sources. This is obviously only a snippet of the full picture here, but I think it's really helpful to keep in mind the way that you know we think of these as insurance companies when we talk about them, but they are very, very quickly becoming different healthcare conglomerates, right? Um, they had an advantage in the pandemic, of course, of being able to take their time, plot strategic moves when it came to M&A, while everyone else was having to really scramble in the crisis. And so I think we're seeing them um, accrue the continued benefits of that position. It was a very helpful time for them to be able to make some strategic acquisitions. Once again, I think Medicare Advantage is a really interesting area to watch as a leading example. And I think it's driven a lot of the activity here. Again, that virtuous cycle of um, having the revenues to enable funding in the infrastructure that helps you get the revenues. Um, the, it, it encourages this creation though of this integrated ecosystem, especially in home care infrastructure. And I think that's what we're starting to see take uh, shape is you know, this trying to assemble these different care models um, that connect different pieces of the outside the hospital environment and really anchor around um, certainly virtual, but also especially based in the home. Um, these are the different models we see, the pace of adoption for all home care services, they're not going to um, you know, move at the same speed. And we're hearing uh, you know, differences depending on what type of organization we're talking about. But I think these large payers are really looking to try to control all these home and home care adjacent assets in order to direct what happens with their, their patients and try to, again, mitigate conditions from um, being exacerbated, leading to hospitalizations and the like. I got another question in advance of the presentation uh, about this increasing financial gap between payers and providers. So if we've seen this story so far of um, a lot of strategic investments that health plans are able to make right now, especially the national players. Um, where do health systems stand these days in terms of, of their approaches? I think this is a place of really stark contrast. Um, health systems have a really different M&A environment than the large insurers as we've looked over the last year. So most of this, the deals that we've seen, I think are really centered around getting scale in order to, um, you know, be defensive to survive rather than trying to target specific capabilities that you want to add. 
over the last couple years, um, as we look at the hospital M&A space, we've seen a decline in the total number of transactions announced, but this big increase in the size of each deal, the mega mergers now becoming more normal. And even though the FTC is bringing more scrutiny to that climate, um, and they've had some successes in, in blocking some of the um, local M&A consolidation in the, the provider market space, we're now in this era of cross-market, non-contiguous geographies um, as, as fruit for mergers, such as the Advocate Aurora Atrium merger. I think it remains to be seen whether these types of mergers will bring value that the systems need them to, but they certainly are hoping to you know, find some level of synergy, but certainly add to their overarching revenues instead of power. This is not uh, exactly vertical integration though, right? And so what I think is really interesting is looking at physician practices specifically. Because we know that hospitals um, are, are very interested in continuing to try to own and employ um, physicians specifically for the sake of, of you know, managing the overarching referral journey and, and focusing on keepage. And here is where I think a really interesting thing that happened last year is worth looking at. Um, we have crossed the point where ownership by corporate entities, so not hospital organizations, um, ownership of physician practices has surpassed that of hospital ownership. We saw a slight increase in hospital ownership of physician practices over the last few years, but in general, it is being far eclipsed in terms of trajectory by these corporate entities that are um, purchasing some of the larger multi-specialty practices out there. And as we've talked um, with our you know, physician uh, research team, the, the conversations they have with physician practice executives is really on um, expectations they have for their partner. They are really discriminating about what they want. They want to think about what are the different levels of autonomy that they're going to retain? What are the things that they're going to give up? Um, and often where is their you know, business incentives and mission aligned with the culture of the, the owning organization? And often we're, we're hearing that not be in favor of the health systems and hospitals, um, which is counter to the desire that we hear, of course, from hospital executives who want to keep acquiring those practices. So let's take a quick look at what that corporate ownership trend um, really means in reality. I think the way that we have started to conceptualize um, these is, is the term super practice, where these are um, the, a set of themes that I think we're starting to see emerge over these types of corporate owned practices, where they are very well resourced with technology. They aim to centralize and standardize their care referrals, um, their care protocols. They have you know, a holistic, multifaceted, multidisciplinary care team, um, flexible infrastructure, and they have some autonomy trade-offs for the physicians, right? Of maybe you give up referral control in exchange for longer appointments um, and more schedule flexibility. They're really growing rapidly. They're often heavy in, in Medicare Advantage risk, although not exclusively. And they are increasingly aiming to reduce the use of hospital care. So when we look at that landscape, it doesn't necessarily have to come at the expense of the health system. So notice I said they're trying to reduce the use of hospital care. That doesn't mean they are trying to reduce the role of the health system. We actually see them taking different strategies in different markets. So when we look at prominent disruptors like Privia, One Medical, ChenMed, um, they're partnering with health systems in certain, certain markets. They're trying to improve um, care coordination, escalation of referrals to specialty care with those partners, risk performance, um, even throughput and performance, right? We know that health systems are dealing with capacity issues right now, and so this is very helpful. But when you look at different markets, those very same players can just as easily take a different posture. Um, they can partner with payers and employers to circumvent hospitals. So there's not yet a one-size-fits-all nationwide approach to how these will play out. Um, and I think this is a big area to watch. And I think it's really going to be um, incumbent upon the systems and the payers to see how do they actually approach partnership with these different practices. You can see some areas where um, system partnership um, is a foundational partnership, and then 
gives the, the super practice a foothold in the market and then later flips it on its head. I think the ultimate strategy is going to be dependent on the market conditions of whether there's more opportunity in lowering, um, getting to lower cost options and better condition management, or if there's more room for capturing market share through referrals. But it's going to come down to, um, you know, the conditions of partnership from these different incumbents, what they're offering, what they're bringing to the table, and what they're willing to give up. So will payers be willing to give up their broad networks in order to constrain referrals a little bit more? And will health systems start to think differently about where the hospital fits in their overarching business model? So there's a lot of trade-offs that all the players involved um, are going to need to think about. We've seen a lot of really prominent um, deals going after physician assets and a, a few um, provider support assets over the last year. Really, really high dollar value deals, um, very splashy news attention um, or headline grabbing deals. What I think we have to pay attention to is how the assets um, map back to the specific goals that the overarching organizations have. Some of them, I think, have articulated exactly how this fits into the strategy. Some of them um, don't always do that. And so that's always a discriminating lens we need to bring um, as we look at what is the potential for this deal to create new capabilities that make sense for the strategy of the overarching organization. So last area, you know, speaking of pouring billions of dollars into ventures, I wanna talk about what's happening with investments in treatment and technology innovation. Big, giant inevitability um, in all of this is we have vastly more diverse, targeted, expensive innovations coming um, to us in the future. We've got one of the most robust drug pipelines in history, looking at double the number of drugs currently in the R&D pipeline as we were eight years ago. And it's not just the volume to pay attention to, it's the types of treatments and who they will benefit. Um, there's been a massive increase in treatments for rare diseases and a bigger focus on targeted therapies and precision medicine. And finally, the types of populations that these treatments will be relevant for is getting broader because of all the different ways that um, you know, life sciences organizations have been experimenting with how they do clinical trials and trying to um, expand the uh, real world evidence that they're bringing to the table here. So when we zoom out for the healthcare industry, which is already of course, fragile, strained, full of high costs, we need to figure out the financing and operations of man managing more and more of these emerging therapies because you know, it might feel like these are small populations of patients right now, but where we are headed is lots of small populations that are all extremely high costs in the near future. And so where do we make those individual decisions those are gonna have ramifications for the precedents, um, the ways that we can control, and, and how do we think about bringing clinical evidence into play here. The other couple big investments I wanna highlight um, and, and modality shifts that we've seen over the last couple of years to pay attention to um, is in home-based care um, overall. And I think here it's important to not treat home-based care with the broad brush to actually disaggregate what different types of modalities um, and specific services and, and care models are we talking about? Because they all are not going to scale in the same way with the same populations under the same financing model um, and to the same degree. So some of them are gonna to have to be more narrowly deployed with the right pa patients and are gonna succeed more in niche markets with the capacity constraints, um, with risk-based payment, really fitting into um, this very narrow management of high intensity need members. Other services should can and should completely become the new standard of care, like telehealth, um, probably home infusion. And these have the advantage of the numbers in terms of demand, um, the enormous appeal uh, from a human perspective, and the opportunity to potentially enable lower cost alternatives or shifting um, to other lower cost elements of care. So if, for example, home infusion gives payers a lot of influence over the specific drug and sourcing procurement mechanism used. So there are interesting ways that this is going to transform um, how healthcare services are deployed, but also all of the follow-up um, and follow-on costs and ramifications downstream. Zooming in really quickly on telehealth, and this will be um, the final area we'll talk about briefly here. 
since this was such a big leap that we made during the height of the pandemic, um, it's important to note that while virtual visit volumes dominated the conversation and have kind of um, come back down a little bit to normal levels or, or closer to normal, but higher than they ever were before, the real innovation road ahead is around remote patient monitoring and asynchronous care. Um, these have really amazing potential, but need to have the right conditions to work. Um, and we're still early on in how we've actually deployed these across the healthcare sector. So for anyone not familiar, remote patient monitoring is all about tracking patient data on an ongoing basis, um, wherever they are and transmitting it back to clinicians. Asynchronous care is about allowing patients and providers to communicate not in real time. So think about all the AI driven messaging for triage um, to patient portal messages. Um, and I'm sure many of you are eagerly watching everything that's going on with chat GPT and how that's waking up everyone to the possibilities um, of different AI technologies. When we look at where we're at, um, again, not as far as we were with real time virtual visits, there's a lot of room to go. Um, in terms of actually getting these technologies deployed across different healthcare providers. And as we talk to different providers, um, they very much want to explore these technologies. They want to use them um, in their workflows to improve efficiency. They want to change you know, what they're capable of in terms of patient monitoring and condition management. Um, and I think there's probably some indications that, you know, it's not fully measured and captured here since a lot of value-based programs um, and value-based payment models don't really specifically reimburse for remote patient monitoring programs, but we know those providers use them anyway. But the majority still want to figure out how to build these options out more. So there's a lot of room to um, support providers in their deployment there. I think where that leaves us, though, is needing to reflect on what does that change about the overarching influence over patient care? So this is the last um, big point I wanna make before we wrap up here. Um, when we think about telehealth tools with the lens of these additional capabilities that they're bringing, not just as a direct replacement for an inpatient, for an in-person service, there's a lot at stake here. Um, so if we look at the typical journey through healthcare, it's a series of different interactions and touch points with various um, healthcare organizations and staff, and each decision can cascade into the next one for better or for worse. In our new digital era, uh, where this technology is becoming ubiquitous and a part of the norms of, of care delivery, this influence spectrum is changing in a few big ways. We're adding new ways of accomplishing an existing interaction, like scheduling, and then we're also adding entirely new touch points altogether, like the remote patient monitoring device setup. These new mechanisms bring ways for all different types of other players besides clinicians um, with the traditional provider organization to get more involved. So the vendors, the plans, employers, MSOs, they're not just setting up the constraints for a decision prior to it occurring, like a copay tier, they're actively pushing and pulling data in and out to influence the consumer in real time. And so I think that is gonna have a bearing on how we all start to design um, the consumer experience to come back to that. I think there's potentially a tension between, are we focused more on improving what we can accomplish in healthcare and, and improving overall care efficiency, or are we more focused on getting consumer attention? Um, trying to use this technology to grab a potential patient and send them on a different course and maybe make them have a relationship with a different provider than they would have otherwise. So there's territory for this to be about collaboration and there's territory for this to be more about competition. And I think in general, um, you know, that's where we start to see the industry potentially headed. There are a number of big decisions um, that you know, strategic leaders are making right now around some of these big areas. I've touched on them throughout the, the presentation. Again, this is an abbreviated form of our research. So if you're interested in any of these um, particular areas, we've got a ton more on that, please reach out. But overall, I think we can look at the future and paint a world of either flexible fragmentation, um, where it's chaotic competition, diverse, flexible, fragmented players, 
um, may be possible for pushing for more consumer choice and split incentives um, and a lot of innovation there. The other is more of a con coordinated order that's controlled by comprehensive integrated behemoth, um, which is more likely if we continue to go down this route towards closed ecosystems, um, vertical integration. So neither one of these is necessarily better or worse, although I'm sure that you have opinions um, in your gut right now as you look at this. Certain organizations might prefer one over the other, depending on their own capabilities and operations. We believe that a leader's job in this context is to know thyself and their own organization. You have to think about which future state is gonna be best for your organization. And you need to think about how will you shift if um, you know, we move towards one side or the other as you're watching the market evolve? What will you do to prepare your organization for success in either of these routes? So again, as I said, um, ton of detail on all of these big strategic areas. Here's a brief recap summary here. You can get all the materials, um, including a written report that discusses a lot of what I shared today at this landing page. Got an easy QR code for you. Um, and I will show it again on the, the screen in a minute or two, because I'm going to go through two more slides. Um, but you can use your phone to get a copy of the slides. Um, I believe there's also a link coming in the chat as well. Real quick, uh, with my last couple of minutes here, I wanted to showcase um, a brief review of the advisory board services in case anyone's not familiar. Um, we have everything from you know, digital research resources available on our website um, and through subscription models, uh, a variety of different events and expert interactions and support. We've also got a leadership development fellowship program and sponsorship opportunities for um, you know, working with us to put content out um, in, in the industry. Very much lastly, um, here is a sneak peek at what we're looking at more deeply across 2023 with some of our dedicated research teams. Um, I, you know, in advance, I got a lot of questions about the future of women's health investments, the outlook for enabling access and affordability to clinical innovation, um, and how are different organizations diversifying and integrating. Hopefully, we will be answering some of those questions for you over the course of this year and beyond. Um, but again, please feel free to reach out if you are interested in learning more about any of these. And once again, I will put our QR code up so you can take a picture if you'd like. Um, and again, access the uh, materials in the chat. And I believe there should be a survey as well for feedback and any additional questions you have. But with that, um, I thank you so much for your time and questions today. I will um, we'll be working with you to get back to some of the ones I couldn't get to in the middle of the presentation. And I hope everyone has a wonderful week. Take care. Thank you to Natalie and everyone that joined us today. Please visit our website at hlth.com to catch up on all Health Go Live webinars. And join us in Nashville, March 26th through 29th for Vive 2023.